Hey everybody, it's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon. Welcome to our live Facebook Q and A. We've got a few questions to answer already, um, but I want to make sure and see that my technology is working. Uh, so if you're able to see or hear me, please go ahead and send a comment. Let me know that. Getting myself set up on my phone so I can actually see those comments. All right, where am I? Here we go. Well, I have to start out with an apology. I missed a couple of comments last week, and I want to address the questions that, that um, were in those comments. So I apologize to Cynthia and Judith for having missed their questions. Um, so let me start out first with what they had asked. Um, one, uh, Judith in New Jersey was asking about white crowned sparrows. And is fall the only time that we see them? Or do we also see them in spring? And where do they go in the winter? So let's chat about that for a second. White crowned sparrows uh, do not breed in New Hampshire. They breed farther north uh, and they winter farther south. So for those of us in New Hampshire, we see them in spring and fall migration both times. Um, in the fall, we see the juveniles and the adults. The adults have the black and white stripes on their head, and the juveniles have the brown and tan stripes on their head. And they're a pretty good sized sparrow, and they're still around right now. I had a couple this morning when I was um, out at the community gardens. Um, in New Jersey, they could actually spend the winter there because they winter in the southern part of the U.S. and Mexico. So New Jersey may be at the northern edge of their wintering range. So it certainly is some bird that could be there from fall all the way through spring until they head north again. Um, they're very similar to white-throated sparrows, but they don't have that white throat. White-throated sparrows have the black and white stripes and the is another variation that has brown and tan stripes, so they both have head stripes. Um, but the, the um, white crown sparrow does not have a white throat. And also, most white throats have a little yellow tick by the eye, a little yellow spot. It's really obvious in spring and breeding plumage, but right now in fall, it's not very visible. So, um, so you can look for it, um, and you have to look hard for it, uh, but the white crowns don't have it at all. Uh, so watch for them. They're still moving through here in New Hampshire, and they should be uh, showing up in New Jersey and points farther south very soon. I'm going to check my phone, see if I seem to be coming through okay. Let's see. All right, well, I can't find me. Oh, no, that's not me. All right, well, I'm going to trust that I'm coming through. Um, I'm not seeing any comments. Well, if you're out there and you can see me and hear me, try and send a comment. I'll see if I can find me live. Oh, there we go. Am I going? Let's see. I think I am, but I have not been able to see the, the comments. Let's see if that works. Ah, there we go. All right. Oh, Christian, thank you for letting me know. Great. Oh, wow. Now I just disappeared. Okay, let's try again. Well, okay. So, sounds like I'm coming through. So, let me um, address another question that we got last time that I missed. And that's from Cynthia. She had three great blue herons um, flying over, making kind of a wheezing noise, and wondered if they were really great blue herons. Um, she usually sees them in the evening just flying over solo. Well, the evening is definitely a good time to see great blue herons flying to roost. Um, and the wheezing noise is kind of puzzling. I'm not sure what that is. Usually the noises that great blue herons make are pretty, rah, rah. you know, they're loud. They're squawky noises. Um, but I can't think of what else would have making wheezing noises. Something like um, Canada geese would make noises with their wings, um, but that's not quite wheezing. 
Uh, and then other herons that we might have um, coming over at this time would be smaller birds. There might be a lingering green heron around and that they would likely not be together. So I have to guess that if you had those big herons with the long legs, long bill, they do tuck their, their long neck in when they fly. So it just kind of looks bulky in the front. Um, but that makes the most sense as to what it is, unless it was something like uh, Canada geese making those that wheezing noises with their wings. So, well, hi, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Vicki, Candy. Good morning. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, all right, it's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Don't hesitate to send a comment. You can also message us on Facebook or send an email to birds, etc., B I R D S E T C at nhaudubon.org. Thanks for joining me on this beautiful morning. I'll give a little bit of a migration highlight, uh, not highlight, but a sort of update what's going on. Um, we, we're still in definitely sparrow migration. There are still sparrows around. I mentioned the white crowns are still here. White-throated sparrows are still here in good numbers. Song sparrows are here in good numbers. They'll be moving through, but it's still definitely part of the peak of sparrow migration, at least in the mid and southern section of the state. Um, I was up farther north in Whitefield and Jefferson uh, over this past weekend um, with some stunning views. And um, there were sparrows there as well, particularly white-throated sparrows. So we still got sparrows coming through. The last of the warblers are, are moving through, um, it's primarily yellow-rumped warblers. Uh, but we still have a few palm warblers coming through. Um, and maybe a lingering black pole or other um, warbler here and there, but I've seen very, very few this past week of anything other than yellow rump and palm warblers. Um, pine siskins are showing up everywhere. Uh, they are these small birds that are very similar to goldfinch, but they're all streaky. And they have a little thin bill. Uh, and they're um, a bird of the northern boreal forest. Nor north of us, but some years they move south in big numbers when the food supplies up north are poor. And this is one of those years when they're coming south. And they're still around in big numbers. They may stay through the winter or they may move through uh, during the fall and be scarce in the winter. So we'll be watching to see what's going on with that. But they are everywhere from the seacoast to the Connecticut River Valley and all the way up through the state. So you can see them uh, or maybe hear them pretty much uh, every anywhere in the state right now. Um, we're just beginning to get some waterfowl migration. So ducks and geese are just starting to migrate. Um, so you can see them on some area ponds. Um, the scoters, which are birds which nest inland and winter on the coast, sometimes get brought down in bad weather. So if we have a rainy, stormy weather, that's a good time to check ponds for things like white wing and surf scoters that sometimes come down. I did have a few at Pondicherry Wildlife Refuge on um, Sunday. So they are definitely migrating and they'll be uh, arriving at the coast and they're in pretty good numbers a little bit later uh, as we get into November and December. All right, so I think that's our latest. Oh, there's still a few shorebirds moving through on the coast. Very few inland at this point, uh, but there are a few still on the coast. So when you go to the coast, you might see some semi-palmated sandpipers. Um, actually, semi-palmated plovers are more likely. Black-bellied plovers are still around. Uh, and there were actually a couple of Hudsonian godwits uh, that were at the coast, and that was pretty exciting this past weekend. So let's check, see if I missed any questions or comments. Hi, Susan, thanks for watching. All right, glad you all could join. And um, I'm just checking to see. Okay, so that's our migration update. Thought I'd mention that in addition to birds, there are still other creatures out there. And when I was up at Pondicherry Wildlife Refuge, I actually saw a butterfly flying around. 
it's a morning cloak butterfly was what i saw they're brown with yellow on the edges of the wings and i'm going to try and show you a drawing of one here let's see if i can get this All right there we go hopefully you can see that brown with yellow on the edges of the wings little blue spots and that's a morning cloak butterfly and they actually winter over as adults. So they will find a bark or a log to, um, you know, loose bark or maybe a downed log or tree to go under and, um, and spend the winter there. And so they are one of the first butterflies to emerge in the spring because they winter over as an adult. So you can watch for them. They'll still be flying around on warm days in the warm sunny days. Uh, and then they'll, when they go into hibernation, it's cold. Uh, and then in the first warm days of spring, they come out. So that was a fun treat to see that. Um, I had another question come in. Somebody asked me, uh, Mary asked me if I would talk about cleaning out birdhouses. So let's do that. Um, this is the time of year when it is good to clean out birdhouses. And there are different kinds of birdhouses for different kinds of birds. And they have different requirements. For something like small birds, like um, bluebirds and tree swallow boxes, things like that, you can clean them out now. Um, but it would also be a good idea to clean them out in the spring because sometimes mice get into them over the winter time and build a nest and you want to clean that out. Now, the purpose of cleaning out a nest box and last year's nest is to remove any parasite eggs that are there. So if you've had a bluebird make a nest in the box and then the nest is still there, you want to remove that so that if there are any parasite eggs in the nesting material, they're gone and the box is clean for next year. By the same token, if a mouse happens to build a nest, it's good to get that out of there in case there are any parasites in with the mice um, droppings or nesting material. Um, so you can clean them out now or you can wait, clean them out in the spring. If you do it in the spring, you wanna make sure that you're doing it before they're really back and ready to nest. So that's gonna be around March, March or very early April, depending on where in the state you are. Um, now, the birds will put new nesting material in. For, thing that, for all our small songbirds, you don't need to worry about putting nesting material back in the box. They'll bring their own, and in fact, for some of them, it's part of their pair bonding um, ritual. They will be building the nest. For chickadees, excavating the nest can also be important when they've got a little, like a a dead tree that they're excavating, that's part of their um, nesting behavior. So don't worry about putting new nesting material in. Now there are some birds, particularly bigger birds, uh, like wood ducks and, and um, saw white owls or screech owls, where you want to put fresh shavings back in the box. And you clean out the old material, there, if there are any spent eggs, egg, probably not eggshells, although there could be eggshells still in there. Um, there may be some eggs that didn't hatch. You want to clean that all out and you want to put fresh wood chips back in. Um, they usually like wood chips because normally they'd be in a cavity that was excavated um, by, say, a woodpecker or something like that actually would be a woodpecker because um, wood ducks and sawwood owls cannot peck their own holes. They have to be in a hole that somebody, that a woodpecker has excavated previously and then they take it over. So you wanna put in some, some wood shavings or wood chips in the bottom. Now you can do that now, or you can wait and do it maybe in, oh, let's say February or so. <coughs> Excuse me. For something like owls, and particularly if you have a barred owl nest box, they can begin nesting pretty early in the season. So if you don't do it now, you want to make sure you do it by the time they're going to start 
nesting again. So that means you need to be um, cleaning the box out around February. <coughs> Excuse me, let me get a drink. So, um, I mentioned those those other um, larger birds like wood ducks, you want to put fresh shavings in. Um, and the smaller boxes, don't worry about it. If you have something like a nesting shelf for a Phoebe, an Eastern Phoebe, or for a Robin, it's a good idea to clean that out as well. Again, you want to remove the nesting materials in case there are parasites remaining in the nest. And then next spring, they will build new nests. So that's your scoop on nest boxes. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to send them along. And uh, hello to Christian from Panama. Nice to have you joining again. Just checking to see if there are any other comments. All right. Again, it's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon. Don't hesitate to send a question along. You can post a comment. You can message us. You can send us an email at birds, et cetera, at nhaudubon.org. And thanks for joining us. All right, so we've picked up on the comments uh, that I missed last week in our nest box clean out. So one of the things that I mentioned I would try and do is provide a little bit more about some bird feeding tips uh, to build on what I talked about last week. So last week I talked about some of the basics uh, so if you missed that, you can uh, look at the Facebook video and see what those basics were. And uh, this week, I want to talk about a couple of ways that you can expand your offerings. So again, the general principle with bird feeding is the wider variety of food that you offer, the wide ver wider the variety of birds you'll attract. So we talked about seed last week and suet different kinds of seed and suet. So this week I want to mention another um, way of providing seed and that's with this mesh kind of feeder. I don't know if you can see it here with this mesh. It's a good feeder for something like sunflower hearts. Now sunflower seed is probably the most popular single um, food that we could offer to birds but not all birds can break open the shells. So you can get sunflower hearts, which are just the center seed of the sunflower, and that's what the birds want for food. So if they take one that's, that has got the husk around it, they will peck it open and pull out the meat. And so you can offer just the sunflower hearts, which is that meat of that sunflower seed. And birds like um, like bluebirds will be able to eat it. Uh, or um, goldfinch, who will go after thistle seed feed, can't always break open, again, those small sunflower seeds. They can do some of them, but not all of them. And if you have sunflower hearts, they're easy for them to eat. They also create no mess. So if you, a mesh feeder like that, you can put in sunflower hearts. There are also mixtures that you can put in that have some things like peanuts and other nuts for woodpeckers so that you can have a combination of sunflower hearts and, and um, nuts for woodpeckers uh, that go in that type of feeder and it will attract a variety of birds that can then peck through that mesh and get at the seed. So that's another way of offering seed. Um, I also will mention here, there are mealworms. You can grow, raise your own mealworms if you wanna provide live mealworms, but that's a little bit beyond me. Uh, but they do sell mealworms, dried mealworms, and you can see what they look like here. There we go, whoops, I'm backwards, okay. So they're just dried worms. And um, they're a favorite of things like blueberries. And you can put them in a hanging, this is like a, just a little hanging basket type feeder. And bluebirds, and if you've got a late lingering warbler, it may come along and eat those. 
I'll also say that they can be popular for other birds that maybe you don't want around. In my yard, I have many more house sparrows than I want. Um, and occasionally I get some European starlings, which I don't want either. And they would readily wipe out the mealworms. So at the moment, I'm not feeding mealworms. But if you aren't afflicted with those issues, you could try putting out mealworms and see what you get coming to them. It's a very different kind of food, uh, but one that a lot of birds will eat. And then another thing that you can do for attracting birds is not a food per se, but it's water. So providing water in the summertime when it's dry or in the wintertime when things are frozen can be really helpful. And there are de-icers. Let's see if I can get this. So bird bath de-icer that you can put in an existing bird bath. Or you can get the type of um, uh, bird bath that I have, which already has a plug in it and the whole thing, it can just be plugged in and it will keep the water from freezing. It's not a separate unit you put in the water. It's part of the bird bath itself. Um, and those are, can be magnets for birds. I know a lot of people this um, particularly late summer had a lot of birds coming to water. Now, where do you put water? Well, lots of birds like to go for water on the ground. And that's gonna be something that I try next year. In the winter time, I don't put it on the ground or don't wanna put it on the ground because it would get all covered up with snow. So I have a stand that my, my heated bird bath is on and it came with the bird bath. So it was easy to put up um, and uh, get the bird bath on it. But you do want to put it near some cover because if birds are coming in, just like your, your seed feeders, they want to go and land on a particular um, like protected spot, an evergreen or dense bushes or something like that, and then come to the feeder or to the water dish get their water, take their little bath, and then go back to a protected area. So um, that keep that in mind when you're putting out anything like um, water or your um, seed feeders as well. All right, hi to a number of people. And Katie and CJ and Mike, thanks. And Christian, how often do you need to clean and replace the food in the feeders? That's a good question on that. Um, and it depends very much on what kind of, of um, food you're offering and what the feeder is like. So if you have something like a tray feeder and you get some rain and the seed gets soggy, you're gonna wanna clean it out. I try and put out on a, a, a feeder like that only as much seed is going to be eaten in a day. Now, if you have another kind of feeder like the tube style feeder, you just fill that up and then when it goes down, fill it up again. I do recommend uh, cleaning your feeders before you put them out. Clean them with a mild solution of bleach and water. <clears throat> or you can clean them when you pull them in. I, well, for those of us who have bare issues and have to pull our feeders in in the spring, that can be a good time to clean them. Now, if you have any sign of birds that have um, a sickness, now the conjunctivitis, the house finch eye disease is a good example of that. And every once in a while we get a sal salmonella outbreak in birds and you get um, birds that get all puffy and they're not doing well. If that happens, you want to pull your feeders down, clean them immediately in a solution of bleach and water, and stop feeding for a short amount of time to allow the flock to disperse and not be so concentrated at your particular feeder. So hopefully that answers the basic questions on that. Um, Hi, Susan. Thanks for letting me know you can see and hear me. It's always good to hear that. And hi to two Sarahs and Lori. Um, the other thing about food in feeders, um, by and large, if you're putting out seed, it doesn't go bad. 
if you are putting out suet and we get warm weather and it's warm weather, then it can go bad. So the warmer the weather, the smaller the amount of suet you want to put out, or you want to um, make sure that it doesn't go rancid. So that may need um, changing, or you may just put out a smaller amount so it gets eaten faster. And then hummingbird nectar, again, depends on how hot it is, uh, but you'll want to replace that um, every uh, two to three days if it's warm, and even shorter than that if we get our 90 degree heat days. Now that's not going to be an issue right now, uh, but I have still been getting questions about when to take down hummingbird feeders. Some of us still have our feeders out because we just haven't pulled them in. It's not a problem to leave them up. Hummingbirds are cued to migrate by day length, not by whether there is food around. So if you leave your feeder out or happen to accidentally leave it out, it will be there if there's a late migrant coming through. And somebody just reported one coming to their feeders a few days ago. It sounded like it stayed around for a couple of days, stocked up on some nectar uh, from the feeder, fed it the feeder, and then took off. So it can still be a help. Um, and if you pull them in, that is fine too. Um, the one thing to, to note, if you do leave your feeders out late by accident or on purpose, it's a time when sometimes rare hummingbirds show up. And the one that's most likely to be seen here in New Hampshire in the fall is the Rufus hummingbird. Uh, it's difficult, if not impossible, sometimes to tell from the Allen's hummingbird. Um, but if you have a hummingbird that shows some rusty color, snap a picture and let us know. Um, it's a great thing to see, and there might be others who would be interested in coming by to see it. Uh, all right. And Christian asks, for hummingbird feeders, what is better for cleaning? Bleach and water, vinegar and water. Um, I'd be most tempted to use bleach and water, although I think if you're cleaning your hummingbird feeders frequently, like if you clean it each time you change your nectar, you could just use soap and water. That would be fine. Uh, when you, If you found that maybe you've got some mold growing or something like that, then I'd use bleach and water. Um, but I don't, I've not read anything that says that vinegar is a problem. So I'm, this is just um, Becky's personal suspicion. Um, so I'd, I'd go with, with that, um, lacking any other um, further evidence that may prove me wrong on that. Okay. Um, oh, like, boy, we're, we're going quick. Our time's going quickly. If you have a question, don't hesitate to uh, make a comment. It's Becky with New Hampshire Audubon. Uh, you can also message us on Facebook, or you can send us an email at birds, etc. B-I-R-D-S-E-T-C at nhaudubon.org. So I wanted to check and see what else. I have not covered that I thought would be important to let you all know about. Um, okay, we'll save, save one of those. I've got a little list of topics I want to talk about, and we're going to have to save a couple of them for next week. Uh, we got the hummingbird feeders you can take down. Morning clock. Oh, and I knew there was another prop I had. So windows can be... A, um, a major issue for birds. They bonk into them because they see the reflection in the outside surface of the window. They think they're flying off into the woods. They hit the window and they um, get knocked unconscious. Sometimes they die, sometimes they recover. So there are some uh, window decals that um, you can put on a window Oh boy, this is going to be hard for you to see. Um, and they're ultraviolet, so they're not the black silhouettes that you would be familiar with. Let me see if I can try them back. So for people, oh, this one, 
you don't see them very well, but the birds that can see, who can see ultraviolet light better than we can, see them much more plainly. And they come, there are little leaf, um, leaf designs uh, and other designs that they come in uh, that can be re really helpful. There are lots of different potential window treatments that you can use. The decals are not always the best, but they can sometimes work really well if you have a particular spot in a window that, where they hit regularly. So um, if you're looking for those, we do have them in the New Hampshire Audubon Nature Store, and you can give Craig a call at 603-224-9909. Um, and I, uh, oh, they may even be on our website. I'll have to check that and let you know if you can um, buy them online, because uh, they're easy to um, mail and ship out. Uh, so I encourage you, if you've got birds that strike your window, to pay attention to where and try putting some of, of these um, window decals up and see if that will make a difference. Okay. Hi, Bob. Hi, Elena. And Kristen's got another comment. I read somewhere that the raptor's shadows are not as effective. They're certainly not as effective as some of the other window treatments. You can do um, vertical lines on windows that work really well. Um, they're we actually have some examples of window treatments at New Hampshire Audubon um, at our McLean Center that you can see. Um, but it's kind of one of those things where, again, if you have a particular spot where birds hit regularly, a silhouette may work for that. Uh, I've done it in a couple of my windows. It did help. Um, they were windows where, you know, sometimes birds will leave puff marks when they hit. Um, the morning doves have something called powder down. And um, we'll have to talk about that sometime. But when they poof on the window, leave some behind, you can see where they hit. And so I tried putting a silhouette right where those marks were. And that helped um, in that particular spot. But it certainly doesn't solve the problem as well as some other treatments can. Oh. All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up here. We'll save a couple of topics for next time. Um, and we'll have a feature plant to talk about and a couple of other things going on. If you have any questions, again, you can um, send us a message on Facebook or send us an email. I'm Becky with New Hampshire Audubon. We really appreciate your support. Thank you to those who have made contributions uh, in appreciation of this live Facebook broadcast. I really appreciate it a lot. It helps us continue to, do, to bring you these kinds of um, social media content. Uh, and I'm happy to, um, to be able to share some of the birding world with you all. So that you can make a donation online or you can always send a check in to New Hampshire Audubon. Thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate your support. Till next time, enjoy those birds.